The following conversation is with International Committee of Red Cross Head of Mission, David Tuck. David Tuck is a legal advisor for the ICRC and he is the head of mission um, and wor has worked all across the world in Nairobi, Geneva, Afghanistan, providing humanitarian aid to victims of conflict and violence in his legal advisory role and other associated roles. We, the topic of this conversation is humanitarian effort, is what we can do as individuals and what the ICRC and other organizations alike to them have been doing to intervene when there is conflict across the world, armed conflict, humanitarian um, uh, transgressions that organizations and people like David intervene and have a role to hold countries, states and individuals accountable to humanitarian conflict. And particularly while this conversation is about humanity and humanita uh, humanitarian efforts, a big motivation for me to have this conversation with David was to talk about nuclear weapons. Um, the ICRC, they have uh, a treaty of the prohibition of nuclear weapons, They just, which is now becoming international law. They've signed 50 countries across the world to eliminate the use, ownership, and transport of nuclear weapons. This is something that is very, very important to me philosophically, morally, individually. I think we all have a role to play in understanding the ramifications of the multitude of different ways our civilization could end. There are numerous ways which we talk about, but we particularly talk about nuclear weapons because the ICRC are, are heavily involved in implementing international law to manage nuclear weapons across the world and so that is a big part of the com it's, it's a large part of the conversation and i hope it highlights something that is a topic that it doesn't often get talked about um i really wanted to highlight this conversation and what we can do and give some practical things of what we can do if people are interested uh, collectively as individuals but also as organizations if you ever get to the position of, of a government or authority or government um position then what those people can do and what is being done to push the needle forward. And lastly, we finish uh, with, with David's experience um, working across the world, especially in Afghanistan, um, with the biggest moments of fear, tragedy, and inspiration that he has seen across the world. So I really hope you enjoyed this conversation with David Tuck, and it gives you a different perspective on the world at large and what we can do to be better for one another. For the people who don't know, I want to start this conversation off, you know, talking about the mission that the International Committee for the Red Cross have and their de denuclearization mission. But before we do, can you kind of give an elevator pitch uh, primer on what and who the International Committee for the Red Cross are and your involvement? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Alex. So the International Committee of the Red Cross, that's the ICRC, is a so-called principled humanitarian actor. And what I mean by principled humanitarian actor is that everything we do, all the decisions we make and all the work that we do is predicated upon certain humanitarian principles. And the fundamental ones really are sort of humanitarian, uh, humanity, neutrality, independence, and impartiality. So they're the sort of... Uh, guiding lights or guiding principles in respect of, of all the action that we undertake. Now, the, the ICRC has a particular historical connection to, and actually now a sort of legal mandate for, work in respect of armed conflict. So where you're most likely to find the ICRC is working to uh, protect and assist in particular victims of armed conflict all around the world, wherever that may be. Um, we, the ICRC, though, are part of a larger family or a larger movement. And so many of your listeners might be familiar with, for example, the Australian Red Cross. The Australian Red Cross is a Red Cross national society, of which there are 192 in the world. And that's part of our broader movement or family. Their role and functions are rather more connected specifically to addressing a range of humanitarian and related programs in, say, 
Australia. They also do many very valuable activities abroad, but their focus possibly, we could say, is Australia. Um, and they, together with other Red Cross and Red Crescent societies, form up uh, this, this large movement or family. There's one other body that I'll mention very quickly, and that's the so-called International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. And that has a sort of convening role uh, of all of our 190 so national societies with particular functions linked to things like responding to natural disasters. And that brings together a range of movement partners to address those sorts of issues. So in sum, the ICRC looking rather, if anything, at armed conflict, uh, the Federation and other components of the movement address their humanitarian action and related activities uh, elsewhere. Okay, that's a really good summary. Now, your involvement um, is more on the side of, well, would you say enforcing and regulating the law? How would you describe it? Um, yeah, so the, the ICRC as, a, as an organisation writ large is the so-called guardian of this body of law that's called international humanitarian law, what some people might call the law of armed conflict or the laws of war. And as part of being guardian of that body of law, the ICRC has this huge range of activities that go all the way from sort of developing the law, so thinking of new areas where the law might need to develop to address, for example, new technologies in warfare and related issues. Um, the ICRC will also sort of interpret the law and provide its position and thinking around the modern application of this body of law, which really stems from, uh, in its modern sense, I guess, 1949. Um, and then, as you rightly say, the ICRC has this task to so-called take cognizance of violations of the law. And what I mean by that is just to be aware of when violations have occurred, ideally by speaking to those people who've been specifically affected, and with that information, to approach the parties to armed conflict, the alleged perpetrators, if you would like to think about it like that, with a view to having a discussion and ultimately working with those parties to try to make sure that the same sort of unlawful conduct is not repeated in the future. And there's one very interesting thing, I think, about the way in which the International Committee of the Red Cross works on that particular topic, and that is that it really favours what's called confidential bilateral dialogue. So the ICRC's approach when it's uh, confronted by or when it becomes privy to information about a violation of the law of armed conflict is to take that quietly, discreetly, confidentially to the alleged perpetrators with the view to trying to bring them to an attitude of respect uh, and compliance with the law. How on earth do you do that? Because you have all of these different actors and countries and organizations and they have their own agenda. They have their own purpose for what we see it and what your organization sees as, you know, you may see it as, well, this is morally, you know, questionable and we need to intervene. But for them, obviously they'll have their own justification. How do you bridge the gap to communicate? Can you give any examples of trying to find common ground among people and organizations that may never have had that conversation? Yeah, look, um, Alex, that's an excellent question. I think there's a, there's a lot of parts to, to the answer. Yeah. I mean, in some respects, we have an opportunity to find a common language because we're working in and around the Geneva Conventions of 1949. So that's really the core of this body of, of international law that we work with and for. And those conventions, by the by, have been accepted by every state of the world. In other words, they're so-called universally ratified. And there's a range of other law connected to that that has been accepted by and large by a large number of states. So in a way, if we're talking about coming to states about some of our humanitarian concerns, we're just really fortunate that we have a common language. So we can point to provisions of the Geneva Conventions or our interlocutors, the states with whom we're working, may themselves point to various provisions of the Geneva Conventions with a view to ultimately having, having uh, a discussion to, towards humanitarian ends. But look, you're absolutely right to suggest that finding common ground in other contexts can be more complex. So when we speak about the kind of modern battlefield or battle space where the ICRC is trying to work, there's a huge number of actors, um, not least of all 
is so-called, you know, non-state armed groups. And these groups are part of, or we say party to, armed conflict in, in some or many cases. And at times, I think what the ICRC has seen is that having a discussion that is founded purely or entirely on international law is not always that effective. Mm. Meaning to say, there must be a whole range of other ways that you can present those norms and values, uh, and I think to use to use your language, is kind of norms and values that have this sort of, ultimately, I think, universal appeal, even if you're not discussing it as, as pure international law. Um, I mean, I've, I've heard colleagues of mine over the many years with the ICRC really describe this body of law often as sort of, you know, what's the right thing to do? What's the sort of commonest, common sense approach to this humanitarian problem? Um, so we think this body of law, despite or in addition to being law per se, also resonates with a wide range uh, of peoples and cultures and has, in fact, a long, uh, a long history and pedigree in traditions and religions of the world. So then how do you enforce it? How do you enforce this international law? For example, North Korea, Russia, um, Iran, there are clear transgressions against the, uh, the organization, right? What do you do in those cases when those actors aren't very receptive at all? Well, yeah, thanks, Alex. I mean, this goes really to the heart of, of trying to work through a sort of coherent strategy towards humanitarian ends. Now, look, I won't speak to any specific state or any specific actor, um, but as I mentioned, the main tool available to the ICRC in respect specifically of violations is a sort of confidential bilateral dialogue. Um, and I think the confidential and bilateral nature of what we do has actually provided the ICRC with, generally speaking, stronger access because the parties with whom we engage know very well that the information to which we are privy will not become part of a legal process, for example. It will not result uh, in individual or criminal responsibility um, by virtue of us having it at least. And as a result, they're more willing to come to the table, provide us access to the people who are affected by armed conflict and have a fairly robust discussion around potential violations. And the best example I can think of, Alex, is you, if you look at the ICRC, um, it has historically, and this continues today, had extremely good access or very good access to places of detention around the world. I mean, I think we do activities in detention in something like 80 different countries. Um, some of those may be more sensitive than others, but certainly we manage to find access often uh, in very sensitive conflict situations. And I think it's in part because uh, of our confidential and bilateral commitment, let's say. But needless to say, I mean, your question touches on a lot more. Uh, it's not all about engaging confidentially and bilaterally. The ICRC does a range of other activities, um, including activities that you might normally associate with a humanitarian or even sometimes development actor, meaning to say uh, activities like water and sanitation, activities like contributing to health programs. Uh, activities like um, physical rehabilitation, which uh, the ICRC is very strong in in many parts of the world. So a range of other activities that are addressed, I suppose, less to violations of the law, but more to building up capacity um, to address a range of humanitarian concerns often associated with conflict. That Okay, that provokes a couple things in me. Um, so there is no... It sounds like there's no criminal proceedings that go ahead as a result of violating um, certain uh, regulations and laws. Is that correct? No. Um, no. Look, that's a that's a great follow up question. Alex. Uh, the short answer is no. Um, I mean, sorry. Meaning to say, there are indeed criminal processes that can and should, and in some cases, I would say, must. Okay follow on from a violation of this body of law. So what are we talking about, just for your listeners who've not, who've not perhaps worked with or seen this body of law in action, what we're talking about in a criminal sense is what most people would call war crimes. Now, war crimes are just international humanitarian law in its, let's say, criminal form. So I, the ICRC, we speak about international humanitarian law, it's a responsibility of states. But once it is criminalized, it becomes a war crime. Mm. 
So a serious violation of IHL is a war crime. And in that situation, states themselves, first and foremost, are responsible to uh, investigate these alleged violations and, if necessary, prosecute in accordance with their own domestic law. What you'll find is that most states of the world, not all, and it's something on which we're constantly working, but most states of the world will have law, legislation that brings those criminal offences into domestic law and would enable them to, you know, investigate and prosecute and ultimately to punish if necessary. Um, and it's possibly, I think, a misconception of, of humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, a misconception that it doesn't happen. I actually think domestically, these sorts of prosecutions uh, are ongoing more often than we think. And they begin, of course, with often military investigation that can become part of the, the civilian process. So that's domestically. And then, of course, as you know, um, we do have a number of courts, whether they be um, linked to specific events in a time and place, or whether we think of even the International Criminal Court. And the International Criminal Court has two a mandate uh, and a responsibility to, in certain cases, prosecute and punish violations of this body of law as well. Do you have an example, like a st like in your experience of, you know, a country or a state coming to the International Court of Law and being prosecuted? Because we're talking a bit of theory. I'm just trying to conceptualize it into like a, a practical something that's actually occurred. Yeah. Well, look, no, it certainly has happened. Um, Many times, I would say, probably the best place to find um, the most jurisprudence, so the most um, developed jurisprudence might be around the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And there, the so-called ICTY has absolutely um, brought people before the court and prosecuted them for uh, serious violations of international humanitarian law or, or so-called war crimes. Um, and those war crimes may be... Uh, the result of, say, force being used or attacks against people who are protected, I'm thinking particular civilians, or those war crimes may be linked more to the treatment and conditions of people in, say, a place of detention, because that's another area uh, in which the law of armed conflict is protective of, of people affected by armed conflict. So case law of the ICTY, case law of the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, um, I mean, certainly the International Criminal Court as well. So there are, there are many examples um, at the international level of prosecution for serious violations of IHL. Well, what's, the, what's the consequence? What does the actual prosecution look like? I mean, ideally, you guys want to go in there, provide humanitarian aid and help the people under distress. But for the country and state and actor, like what consequence do they bear? Um, well, you're touching on a couple of different things there, Alex. So if we're speaking about criminal law, of yeah. course, what we're talking about um, would be consequences for an individual. So the consequences for an individual of being found guilty of these kinds of violations might normally be in many contexts, of course, imprisonment. Um, but you're also touching on a broader question, which is the role of this body of law as between states, mm. because it is a form of law that governs the relationship between states. And as it exists between states, states themselves are often at the front line of, we could say, enforcement. Okay. And what we don't always realize is that states in many respects are doing this all the time. And it's very much part of their ongoing and continuous diplomatic rhetoric. I mean, if you look at some of the language, for example, that was used to discuss what was going on in Syria for many years, you'll see that the way that states were speaking was to uh, suggest that the other or another state was in violation of international humanitarian law. So I, I say that to point out that this body of law works through often and is at least indirectly enforced in the, the state diplomatic right. space. Um, and there are other mechanisms to, to require states to abide by the law. That, that makes sense. So it's, it sounds like it's about highlighting, bringing awareness and putting pressure and accountability to the state to do a better job at regulating certain humanitarian efforts. Now, obviously that's best case scenario. They, you, you highlight it, they address it, things are better. But I'm sure there's been numerous scenarios where the state will be unresponsive or unwilling to cooperate, but you know 
that there is severe humanitarian conflict occurring, what can you do in those circumstances? Yeah, look, um, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. I'll say too, just to ensure that the, you know, the narrative around this body of law has, I think, uh, for some time now being relatively negative, meaning to say that what people see, and this is completely reasonable conclusion to draw, is they see on television that there are violations of this body of law. I mean, and the nature of armed conflict, of course, leads to abhorrent violence that is difficult to countenance. That's the very nature of armed conflict, unfortunately. Um, but what I would like to point out is that in many respects, it's not all doom and gloom and non-compliance. Okay. And by that, I mean, what we can actually see is that particularly modern professional armed forces are in many respects, very, very committed to training, disseminating this body of law to their soldiers and to making sure that when they go forth, they abide by it. Um, so we can find examples of, or many examples of, of good lawful conduct. What's a bit tricky to say sometimes is that when a soldier does the right thing under humanitarian law, was he or she doing that because of the law or because, as we said before, he or she just thought it was the right thing. That's a difficult one for us to prove. We can't say definitively that he or she was acting lawfully because of the law or because of other reasons. And what we know from some of the ICRC's research, and there's been some publications, including something that's called the, the roots of restraint in war, what we know is that soldiers are influenced by a huge range of things other than the law. So they might be influenced, for example, by their contemporaries, by the group with which they operate and, and the attitude towards lawful conduct that is presented to them by their colleagues. So there's, there's a huge range of factors, of course, even personal personal upbringing. Um, so that's a long way of, 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 of reassuring our listeners that in many respects, the law is followed. I've certainly seen it followed myself in, in real time, uh, in many cases, actually, consistently. Uh, and the ICRC now has... Um, a database, if anyone's interested, called IHL in Action. It can be found simply through Google. And what IHL in Action does is precisely this discussion we're having. It says, look, let's take a range of case studies and let's see precisely how, in fact, the law was followed. So that's an important part of the discussion to keep in the, in the back of our minds. Um, and in many respects, not all, there's a lot of serious humanitarian concerns, but in many respects, warfare these days might actually broadly be rather better for the civilian population than it was when you think, for example, of things like the, the Second World War. Um, but, but your question was really about what to do in, in case of repeated violation. Um, I mean, there'll be a number of actors that, that might potentially be involved. I've said that we prefer at the ICRC this really discreet confidential bilateral approach. But Alex, remember, of course, we're not the only actor in this field. So there are many others who, in certain circumstances, will, or maybe even more regularly, will feel the need to or comfortable to speak about many of these things in the public domain. And of course, what they're trying to do is influence public opinion, mm. quite rightly, towards humanitarian ends, and ultimately uh, influence government behaviour. So there's a range of other actors. The ICRC, in case of repeated violations that it itself has witnessed, um, and that are serious, and where the ICRC has taken measures to try to bring that party into compliance with the law, the ICRC, if I can say it like this, does reserve the right to occasionally make public statements. It happens exceedingly rarely because of all the reasons we discussed linked to preserving great access and a good confidential bilateral space. So there's an, a number of responses, I think, to your to your question. Yeah, that, no, that's that is a a good reply and just really gives me and I think hopefully people listening a much more thorough understanding of how you guys conduct your affairs. I want to shift to now kind of the main thing that instigated me even coming across you and finding this conversation. I believe I was wanting to speak to Helen originally, um, but obviously uh, that was, wasn't going to happen right now. And so that's what came across us. Um, what most people don't understand or aren't aware of, I don't even think they're even think about, is the risk for nuclear 
worldwide or localized conflict. And it's like this subtle thing that just plays in the background that we don't really think about too often, but can significantly and dramatically shift our entire civilization and the human species as we know it. And that's where the ICRC come in. And you guys just had your 50th ratification of the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And it's set to become international law, which is huge. I, it sounds huge. But can you kind of give a background on what the ultimate mission is for this treaty? And how do you stop countries from holding nuclear weapons when they could lie to you? Yeah. Yeah. Look, Alex, um, a great introduction to the topic. I mean, as you said, um, the concern around nuclear weapons, and of course, we're fortunate that we don't have this on our minds all the time, because I think it would be of, of serious concern were we to be reflecting on it. The risk of nuclear weapons is disastrous. Uh, I mean, is is absolutely and totally horrendous. One thing that the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement has been keen to reiterate is to counter any sort of suggestion that there could be any kind of humanitarian response in the case of the use of a nuclear weapon. In other words, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement has been very keen to point out that there absolutely is no current humanitarian response that would be sufficient to address the enormous widespread, wide-scale and long-lasting effects of the use of a nuclear weapon. So horrendous would the potential outcome of that use be. Uh, and we need to keep that in mind, I think, whenever we're talking about these weapons and, and indeed also some of the political considerations about why in some circles um, it continues to be argued that we require uh, to have them. You mentioned the use of weapons and you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, that would be totally a worst case scenario. But I think what's really been on people's minds these days is also the risk of misuse the risk of accident, yeah. the risk of corruption, the risk of theft. Um, and one issue here is not only say that these weapons might be physically stolen, I'm not sure how feasible that is, but one of the challenges in the modern world is that nuclear technology is connected to cyber infrastructure and to the digital world, and the risk may well be that someone is able to enter the system, corrupt, uh, and use it for their own potentially nefarious purposes. So just to keep that in the back of our minds, it's not only always about this question of use, but, but very much about, um, about the risk of misuse, if I can say it like that. Um, so you're right, you mentioned the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, and this is, in your words, and I totally agree, huge. This is fantastic. This is a really great piece of news in a year that's been so difficult for so many people. So we now have 50 of our, uh, what, 193 states of the world who say, okay, look, enough is enough. Um, we agree to be legally bound, um, not only not to use, although that's part of it, not to use these weapons, but also not to acquire them, not to transfer them, not assist others to use them, not even really to keep them on our territory. There's, there's more to the prohibition inside of the particularly Article 1 of the TPNW. So this is fantastic news, um, really fantastic news. And it will, as you say, I think, come into force, become legally binding as of the end of January 2021. So to turn to your question, how how do we ensure that states actually abide by their commitments under this particular instrument? Um, look, I think there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is that we as responsible citizens must always be aware of the risk that some sort of international instrument uh, is used potentially as a fig leaf for untoward or unlawful behavior. I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, but there are certain checks and balances. So this particular treaty is not the only treaty connected to nuclear weapons. It's the first full prohibition, but it's not the only treaty. Uh, amongst others, there is a non-proliferation treaty uh, to try to, as the title suggests, prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons, particularly amongst states uh, who didn't previously have them. And there are certain safeguards connected with those treaties that are picked up by the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And that's a long way of saying that what the TPNW says 
is it says that existing agreements with the IAEA, that's the International Atomic Energy Agency, need to be maintained under the TPNW. And these agreements with the IAEA are, in some cases, depending on the nature of the agreement, a sort of check and balance against the risk that a state behind the scenes will then be developing a nuclear program. There are different kinds of agreements with the IAEA, but some of them may allow for things like verification, monitoring and evaluation, just to ensure ultimately that nuclear purposes are peaceful. And that's the most important thing, right? That they're peaceful. So there is this idea a little bit in, enshrined in the TPNW, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, it's itself, and that's already uh, a very, very good thing. Um, if we think about beyond the, the legal discussion, if we think a little bit about the, the reality of this context, uh, and let's put it in our Pacific region, I always think that um, for states of the Pacific, the risk uh, and the experience of nuclear weapons has been so profound and so serious that they will be motivated by entirely the right purposes to join an instrument like this. And what we have to think about is the fact that of the 50 states that are now prohibiting nuclear weapons, 10 of them are in this, the Pacific region. And why might they be doing that? They might well be doing that because they have themselves been exposed to the consequences of nuclear testing. Um, something like 300 or more than 300 tests have been conducted uh, in the region. So I tend to believe when we look at the context or the background like that, that the states that have undertaken these obligations now uh, intend to do so in good faith um, towards ultimately a, a nuclear free world. Um, so we hope that it, it continues to progress in that way. Do you think you'll see that in your lifetime? Do you think you'll see a majority? Do you think you'll see a nuclear-free world in your lifetime? I would. I would love to. I would. I would very much hope that that may be the outcome of of steps that are being taken now. But your question, I think, really rightly, would lead me to say this is just the beginning. This is really just the beginning, and it's it's a it's it's odd that we think of this as the beginning given that we know that it's been a 75-year-long discussion. I mean, 1945, the uh, atomic weapons were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and now here we are uh, in 2020 or 2021, when it eventually comes into force with the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So we are very, very, very much at the beginning. Um, and there will be, or there are, a lot of um, very informed, very conscientious, and very hardworking actors who will continue precisely what they've been doing since particularly this treaty was agreed in 2017, and they'll continue doing precisely the same thing looking ahead. Uh, if, you're if your listeners are interested in following up on, on any of these topics related particularly to this treaty, um, I'd recommend that they look up the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, that's ICANN. And ICANN is a Nobel Prize winning organization, I think it won in 2017, um, that is a sort of coalition of, of like-minded NGOs and others working on, on precisely these topics, and they will continue very much to, to promote this treaty and to work towards other states accepting it. There are many others, including our very own Australian Red Cross has done an immense amount of work uh, in precisely this domain. So worth looking, looking up some of what they've, they've produced. The... Treaty, well, I mean, as, as I think our, our, our discussion uh, alludes to, what some states will say, of course, that is that, you know, the security uh, of, of the modern world order is maintained by having some of these nuclear weapons. They would speak about mm. the deterrent effect. Um, so somehow these nuclear weapons make us safer. Um, it's a very difficult argument to countenance and to really appropriate from a humanitarian perspective. It's just really hard to find ourselves in this unwinnable position whereby that thing that is protecting us, so-called protecting us, is also the very thing that would be the absolute and total end of humanity. Um, I mean, if not also just many horrendous years or decades of suffering for many people. So it's yeah. it's it's an uncomfortable position, I think, to to have arrived at. And and 
you know, we're at a point perhaps where we ought to be a little bit more creative about the ways in which international peace and security is maintained, such that we do not have to do it with these sorts of weapons. Um, and the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement is keen always to simply point to the consequences in Japan. Uh, I mean, decades, generations on, there's still issues related to the use of those weapons for the people involved, not to mention uh, the environmental consequences uh, as well. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, and, and we will do. There'll be a meeting of states parties of this treaty uh, within a year of its entry into force, and that hopefully will continue to give it some life and, and push it forward. Well, it's really tricky. I want to back up to what you said uh, before about it. Ma that's maintaining the security and autonomy and superficial dominance of the state, which many countries uh, rely on um, for their intimidation and for their general power and autonomy. It, and it's tricky because there's the saying that it's, you know it's better to have and not need than need and not have. How do you how do we reconcile that that you know if Australia have no nuclear arms right yet if the world then enters into nuclear conflict we have no potential deterrence system besides a defense system we don't have an offensive system and and it's this tricky conversation that I don't know the answer to. Yeah. Look, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert in this area at all, but presumably if we can ultimately move towards a nuclear-free world, we could do so in a way that builds confidence amongst those states who, you know, in inverted commas, rely on the nuclear umbrella and the nuclear deterrence. We've built confidence between them uh, that nuclear disarmament will take place uh, in a way that is uniform and across all of these states concerned with a view to ensuring um, that we don't simply just change the relationship between states, giving some the entitlement to have this kind of weapon and, and others not. Um, so there was a way, clearly, that it would have to be managed responsibly. Um, but I guess we need to remain optimistic that precisely that would happen. Mm. Part of this discussion, because we're sifting around questions related to international law, and we've, we've spoken about international humanitarian law, part of this discussion is that even if you put aside our Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, there are these commitments undertaken by states under the law of armed conflict, humanitarian law, that would really, ultimately, prohibit the use of these weapons anyway. And what's interesting, in fact, in the preamble of the TPNW is it says words to the effect of any use of nuclear weapons would be contrary to the rules or principles, rules and principles of international humanitarian law. So let me just give you one, for example, humanitarian law says attacks that cannot distinguish between on the one hand civilians and on the other hand lawful targets are prohibited. Attacks that cannot or do not distinguish between civilians and lawful targets are prohibited. Now, one thing you can imagine with nuclear weapons is that it's very difficult, nay, almost impossible to have this kind of technology distinguish. It can't distinguish because simply the effects are so widespread geographically and so widespread in terms of time that inevitably there'll be a violation of at least that rule of international humanitarian law if ever they were to be, and we hope this is not the case, but if ever they were to be used. So that's to say there is a, is a broader framework um, in place already. I would say, um, that would hopefully deter the use, certainly the use of these weapons. Yeah, I think it's a case of, you know, you, you want to get as many actors together as possible, like chipping away one at a time, and then eventually the scales begin to tip in the majority favour, and it became, becomes an overwhelmingly um, worldwide pressure on those other smaller actors to take action. Um, unless you have any comments there, I wanted to actually ask you, what, what what can we learn? What can we take away from Nagasaki and Japan and what happened there with previous, any, any generally previous nuclear armed conflicts? What can we learn from them? How, do, how can we reflect on them? Because my generation especially is very disconnected from the history of our ancestors. 
Yeah, Alex, I mean, that's, that's, that's absolutely the right and, and I think a very important humanitarian question. Um, on, on your earlier point, yes, I totally agree. Where we see the, the value of this new treaty is really, and it's just to paraphrase what you said, on building consensus, building world consensus towards this notion that ultimately we will live without nuclear weapons. And that's why I say it's very much the beginning of a process, because that's the kind of process precisely that will take a very long time. Uh, building a, a, a stigma against the use uh, or even possession and development of these kind of weapons, which will take a long time. Um, look, what can we learn? That's, that's great. I mean, I, there is, in 1945, when these when these weapons were used, so the story goes, there was a delegate or a representative representative of the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, who was able to ultimately, I gather, after some challenges, get into Hiroshima at the end of August, so several weeks after after the detonation. And this delegate, this representative, has this very short, but in some ways, I find it quite profound comment on what was witnessed, which was ultimately, I think, relayed back to headquarters. And the words were, city wiped out. And this for me is perhaps one of the strongest, shortest but strongest representations from uh, an, an impartial witness, even several weeks after the incident, to the use of these weapons. This, this experience upon confronting the city. City wiped out is the way that it was described. And, and I always think of that as, as being short, but probably all encompassing um, when we try to begin to, and of course, uh, people like you and I who'd never fortunately lived through it, we can never begin to really understand it. Um, but it certainly, I think, helps to, to understand the gravity. And the concerns then, I mean, as you know, are related first and foremost to, to the detonation, the explosion itself, um, the, the blast or the movement of air that follows through, destroying buildings up to kilometers away from the weapon. Um, the concerns relate to what it does to the environment uh, and what it does to the environment and humans very, very long term. We've already mentioned that the consequences passed down through generations and the Japanese Red Cross in Japan is still working in and around or with precisely these kinds of issues. Um, and I'm certainly not a tech expert on the nature of these kinds of weapons, but one of the real worries might be that actually what was used in 1945 is relatively small mm. compared to the capacity uh, of modern weapons to uh, cause the same sort of destruction and harm, but on a much, 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 much larger scale. So, yeah, look, I think you're, you're right to touch on the fact that, that fundamentally, at the end of the day, this is a humanitarian issue. It's, it's a risk that we have with these weapons in stockpiles at risk, as we said, of misuse or misappropriation uh, or even use uh, with severe consequences. Thank you for summarizing that. I want to actually highlight a couple of points about nuclear weapons that I've note taken from previously because it's something I feel very strongly about. Um, because I don't think people really conceptualize the effects. Um, there's a channel called Kurtzgeist, which has done a phenomenal job. I don't know if you've seen it or heard of it. I certainly have, and I would recommend absolutely that your listeners uh, find a way to, to, to watching it, yes. Okay, so it's a phenomenal video, but some of the things that they pointed out was if you happen to have your head pointed in the direction of a nuclear explosion, renders you blind for hours. Um, the heat from the light produced from the thermal pulse is so energetic and hot, everything within about 13 kilometers of the detonation site is gone. Um, thermal radiation has a radius of 13 kilometers, and then the total area that can be burned is around 500 kilometers. Um, windows are going to be shattered uh, within an area of about 21 kilometers from that air blast. And I think and that's just, I'm touching the surface just to highlight some of the dramatic effects that we don't, we take for granted and we don't know at any moment and minute, like this, this whole thing is finite. And I think we really need to highlight and put pressure on each other to bring this topic to light from a total humanitarian civilization um, 
species continuation conversation because it's bigger than any one individual. Yeah. Look, Alex, thanks for that. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that puts it perfectly in the in the in the context in which it deserves to be discussed, which is is the risk to us and our environment, our biodiversity, the world and, and our very future. Um, so I think that's very well summarized. OK, so what do you th so from a humanitarian perspective, um, you know, I think people look at organizations and government organizations, they think, OK, they'll deal with it. They have their own systems. What can the individual do to help move the needle forward, maybe with denuclearization or just general humanitarian betterment? Yeah, look, many things, I think, many things. I think that we should all feel um, in a position to be able to appropriate and, and, and argue humanitarian positions. I think um, it's absolutely the right thing to do to take a humanitarian position on on any given argument and 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 to put it forward. Uh, I mean, certainly, I, I would suggest the first thing to do, uh, to the extent that we all have time in our busy lives, is to appropriate some issues of concern uh, to 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 one personally, and and do the best you can to understand a little bit around the discussion so that we can get past a little bit the polemic and the rhetoric, and we can start to hit the real issues that require a little bit of background information and, and reading. I would say in keeping with that, um, that if your listeners are interested, they should really be encouraged to think about the way that they could push their career in, in this sort of direction. That means, I suppose, of course, formal study, um, not just or not exclusively uh, study just for interest. Um, and I've been really fortunate, I think, in, in 15 years with the ICRC to work with a huge number of people who are shifting the needle quite considerably on precisely these discussions. I mean, we've mentioned already ICANN uh, and, and organisations like the Australian Red Cross. Um, certainly my colleagues within all of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, I think, have had that capacity in their own way to, to push the discussion in a certain direction or a certain, I hope, humanitarian direction. Um, but it's not just uh, our line of work necessarily that's able to do that. Um, I've met many very conscientious, responsible, very good international law lawyers and policymakers in government um, who are really thinking about these issues and are doing their best to try to make sure that humanitarianism and humanitarian outcomes are very much part of the often political agenda. Um, the same is true also of, of armed forces, modern armed forces. Um, we've spoken a lot about the law of armed conflict. It'll come as no surprise that the law of armed conflict is really, um, you know, first and foremost, in some ways, the sort of framework and tool for armies, for, for soldiers. Um, and they work in that domain. Uh, and I think in many cases do so very constructively, very professionally, and ultimately um, to, to humanitarian ends. So there's, there's a range of different ways that we can work in this field and, and exercise our influence. Um, Alex, you'll know, you'll know much better than me that, that we're also in a, in a world now where we have um, you know, our own little broadcasting network by virtue of social media. Um, and that can be used really responsibly and it can be used super, super constructively. Uh, by following or, or promoting or, or even just discussing really issues of humanitarian concern and, and through those, those platforms, getting behind those organizations who you feel um, are supporting your values and, and, and pushing the, the agenda that you would like to, um, to see represented. I mean, there are many other ways, Alex. Of course, you know, in a functioning modern democracy, uh, we're very fortunate, I can tell you, to live in one. Um, we comment on international policy, including humanitarian issues, every time we vote. Um, so, you know, political participation in that way is, is a contribution to, to agenda items that you might think uh, are important. Um, so lots of different ways, I think, that we can get behind and use our, our individual capacity to okay. put these things on the agenda. Two things. That's interesting. Okay, so I'm just trying to pass out how we can empower the individual. One, you said self-study. And then becoming like, uh, you know, some type of government official that has some power in the, in the political or, or government um, sector. Uh, and then you mentioned how people vote, which I think that's, yeah, that's really important. So just briefly, even if there's just one person listening who, who's interested in this and it could like, oh, yeah, I want, maybe I want to go further with this. 
what would you recommend they get into um, to study, perhaps be like you or someone along the lines of, of your work? And um, then how would you think about assessing who you can vote for based off these humanitarian actions? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll, I'll touch the, the second one first, just not to, uh, not to take me too far into the sort of political considerations. I think the issue there is just being as well informed as we possibly can be about the party for whom we vote and its agenda and thinking, and this is really the whole direction of our conversation today, thinking not just domestically. Um, it's very easy for us often to have our noses and eyes down looking at what's going on in Australia, and there's good reason for that, and we have many uh, relevant considerations and things to think about in our own lives, not least of all in this really complex time of COVID. But just when you have a moment, lift your eyes up a little, take a look around at the world and think about um, you know, political positioning and discourse in relation to what's going on globally. I think that's, uh, that's an important step that we, we, can, all, we can all take. Um, and then, sorry, Alex, in respect of your second yeah. question. Yeah, so about empowering the individual, like if they're interested in this going further, what would you recommend they study or field or titles or profession? Um, yeah, look, a huge range of things, a huge range of things. Um, Modern humanitarianism and, and development work, I sort of lumped them all together a little bit, uh, is incredibly diverse. I mean, it's incredibly diverse. So an organization like the ICRC really began with, you know, lawyers, one doctor, um, and some representative of the military. And that was a sort of constellation of, of professions used at that time uh, back in the 1860s. The modern workforce is, is really hugely diverse. So we will have experts on water and habitat, and by that I mean they're often engineers, but they might be nutrition experts. We will have people who have learned and studied issues related to microeconomic projects related to economic security. So they'll be very, very good at generating local level economic security projects, the kind of thing that for me as an international law lawyer, I couldn't begin to understand. Uh, we have protection experts. We also rely very heavily, um, as do uh, many other organizations, on people with language expertise. Um, so I'd really encourage listeners to think about a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth language um, if they have the opportunity and time to be able to do so. Um, certainly being able to speak another one of, of the major languages of the world is a huge uh, professional asset. Um, and then we come, of course, to, to rather more my area, which has been um, international law, international policy, um, issues related to um, studying and learning about, about politics and diplomacy uh, in the humanitarian space can all be great tools to launch a, a career in this kind of domain. Not to mention, Alex, the, the tech things. Um, we have a range of, of really competent ICT people, as do all other organizations, um, and they are vital to keep modern humanitarian operations up and running. Uh, so there's a huge amount there. That's great. That's a good place for, for people to hopefully provoke some things. What about the, could people, like for me, for example, like could I volunteer my time and effort or expertise and go live in another country that is suffering humanitarian conflict through the ICRC and offer aid. Is that possible? There, there are ways, absolutely ways to volunteer. I think probably the first place to start is with our friends and colleagues at the Australian Red Cross uh, because they have a very large um, volunteer base and many national societies of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement rely very much on very competent and very skilled volunteers like yourself. Um, so I'd certainly suggest um, considering those possibilities. The ICRC as a general rule probably won't take um, volunteers and that's related to issues of um, you know, their health, safety and well-being in complex conflict environments. Um, there are certain risks, of course, with every staff member being in that sort of environment uh, and it's possibly felt not to be necessarily appropriate for us as an organisation day to day. That said, there are certain um, internship opportunities uh, and I know one that is available annually uh, with the legal division uh, at headquarters tends to appear or be available around about July, August, unless I'm mistaken. Um, and young 
uh, engaged students of international law could consider, say, an, an internship opportunity. Right. So, yes, there are a range of different things you can do, um, even if... In some cases, it might be more challenging to be deployed abroad, particularly deployed abroad to a, a conflict setting. No, that's that's still great. That's still very useful. And there's something there. I just want to make it like practical for people. Um, like, how can we actually move the needle forward collectively? Um, and while we kind of round out this conversation, I want to... Um, one of the last things I wanted to ask you, I mean, there's many things and many topics uh, that I would love to speak further about, but... One of them is a bit more of a philosophical, a bit more of a uh, a darker question, but I think morally I would love to hear your thoughts on it based on your experience. You know, there's a lot of ways that human civilization may end. If you were to put your money on it, um, you know, there's a lot of things. And I know we haven't really talked about like pandemics, nanotechnology, um, ecological disasters, uh war, climate change, solar flares, out of everything that you've kind of considered, or even if you would consider it now, what would you put your money on that that would be the way huma humanity would end? And then to finish it on a positive note, what we could do to circumvent it? Yeah. Look, uh, Alex, good question. I mean, we, we, we certainly live in challenging times, don't we? And, and I think with what's been going on um, around COVID and the global pandemic, we're perhaps a little more all introspective about some of the challenges that we that we face, which is possibly a, a good thing as long as we don't take it too much on board personally. We need to be very mindful in these challenging times of our of our own mental health. Um, you know, I, to finish optimistically, perhaps I'm I'm an eternal optimist about about where we're headed, um, and despite all all the challenges. Um, I mean, I think we have an immense amount of work to do on all of the issues that you've just mentioned. Um, but one of the one of the beauties, I suppose, of working in this line of work is that you also you also get to see the good news story from time to time, and that may be lacking occasionally uh, in popular media and, and, and discourse. And there are lots of good news stories uh, in the humanitarian and development space, despite all, all the many uphill battles. Um, just the other day, uh, the ICRC facilitated the sort of um, mutual release, I would say, of, of well over a thousand uh, detainees, people who'd been held away from their family and friends, maybe in trying circumstances, um, with no, uh, you know, possibility necessarily or no sense of their of their future release and, and return to liberty. And now, all of a sudden, this humanitarian action across the front lines in a conflict situation. Um, returns them, them them to their families. And, and there are these little moments, uh, I think, that are, I hope, indicative of the fact that we are all in our own little way working towards being in a, in a better place. Um, plenty of work to do, mind you, um, but let's try and keep optimistic about where we're headed. <laughs> it's, ha it's hard to get you. Um, I can see you almost don't want to dip your toe into nihilism and <laughs> pessimism. I guess that's a nature of your character or even your profession, which I totally respect and understand. Um, it's kind of a fun thought experiment, but um, you know, I won't, uh, I won't force you to pick an answer. That's just totally fine. That's uh, optimism. Is I mean, how do you stay optimistic for people who are really struggling? You seem like a guy that is very. You've trained yourself to look at the world with the cup half full? How do you do that? I hope so. Um, look, good question. I mean, I've certainly certainly seen many things that have made me very sad. It's not to uh, not to overemphasize that, uh, that it's all glowing and rosy. And certainly in the conflict places where we work, um, you know, there's been, or there is rather, uh, the people there enduring what are now often increasingly protracted conflicts in places like Afghanistan, et cetera, um, Really do suffer an immense amount of hardship all the time, and that's and that's been been very sad. We've also, um, I should point out, lost colleagues along the way, um, which is which has been been tragic, uh, deeply tragic, I should say. Um, but as a general rule, I think that it's the it's the little pearls of of what's being done to make a difference. Um, 
this is why at the very beginning we said, and, and you said it yourself and I totally agree, which is why we sort of need to think of the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in, in exactly the positive light that it can be perceived in. It's fantastic. It is really good news. Let's, let's latch on that. Let's be happy about it. Um, and I think as a general rule, I, I, I take all of the, the smaller and, and, and happier things in life and I try and um, have a positive focus on them. Uh, I probably, like many of your listeners, manage um, manage interaction with with challenges uh, in a range of different ways. And for me, it's very much things like music or, or, or exercise and the like, just to make sure that in the day-to-day grind of what we do, we always maintain a sort of more positive headspace. And I think that's, that's particularly important. Absolutely. David, I want to be respectful of your time. I know, you, I know you only had about an hour, but there's, we can either, I have one more question about your experience in, um, across the world, but if you don't have time, perhaps we could do a round two in the future if I'm ever in Canberra or you're ever in Melbourne, or if you're okay for another 15 minutes, um, I could ask you, what, what would you prefer? Uh, look, Alex, I'd be very happy to stay on for a few more minutes if you've got one or two more questions. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so talking about your experience across the world, um, particularly is interesting to me because I have not been to the countries, or a lot of the countries that you have been and you've had experience in. I know I was reading Nairobi, Geneva, Afghanistan. Um, I, you know, you talked about colleagues tragically passing away and, you know, seeing tragedy around you. What, when you were living in those countries, what do you think was one of the most tragic stories, things that you saw, just to shed some light on some of the humanitarian conflict going on that you've personally seen? Yeah. Um, look, I'll, I mean, many, many things in, 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 in some respects. Um, and, you know, you can be very struck by something uh, because of your you know, emotional state at the time or the situation or the context. And you might reflect on it historically and you think, well, that wasn't necessarily the worst thing I've ever seen if I put it into into a relative scale, but it affected me just because of, you know, maybe where I was at at the time or the particular context. Um, I mean, I certainly remember um, one one gentleman in, in a place of detention, and we, the ICRC, have been doing lots of visits to lots of places of detention. So you become a bit accustomed to seeing people in challenging circumstances. And detention, of course, is a, a very normal thing of, of modern societies, but you know, is, is occasionally at risk of misuse as a fairly strong or almost oppressive tool. So you, you see all aspects, I think, of, of, of the detention life from both sides, from the perspective of the authorities and also very much from the perspective of the, the detainees and the people most affected by it and their families because detention has a huge impact uh, on, on the families of people deprived of their liberty. And I just, I just really sticks in my mind. I just remember it was one of my, the last days of one of my contracts at that particular time. And in the basement of a particular place of detention, there was a young man who'd been shot with, uh, I think, a fairly significant caliber uh, round. Um, and it had gone into his stomach. And he was in, in every respect, he was in a very, very, very bad situation in the basement of this, of this cold place of detention. And the authorities, uh, the people in charge of that place of detention, and this is maybe what, what strikes me the most, is they wanted to get him to hospital. There was no lack of will on their part to get this young man who was, if I can be clear, dying in that cell in the basement of that facility. They wanted to get in there. But outside, it was pouring snow. The situation had been decades of conflict. Where they was didn't, this? this? This is in Afghanistan. Okay. They didn't have access to an ambulance easily at that particular moment, although they wanted to. And the result was that through no, if I can say it, deliberate or intentional uh, action on their part, this young man in the base of this facility was, was slowly, slowly dying. And I think I was really struck by that because... We tend to think sometimes, maybe it's us in uh, the international law field, we think of conflict as being this sort of collection of, of violations of, of the law, let's say, these individual violations. But it really struck me, this incident, because it reminded me, and, and of course, this is obvious in some respects, that the situation in these long-running conflicts is so much worse than the sum of individual violations. So it's not just that one civilian is attacked, which, of course, is unlawful. 
It's that as the years go by in these contexts, society and systems degrade. People can't get a fair go in a legal process precisely because the legal process is no longer there. Or the judge who hasn't had employment is now looking elsewhere to find money rather than sit in court as may be required. Electricity is no longer available. The health services don't work. And in this case, this place of detention, for all of their intents and purposes, really simply couldn't find a way that afternoon to get this this young man to hospital. Um, now, the postscript is, I understand from colleagues afterwards, that he was ultimately, um, with the support and intervention of the ICRC, supported to get to the hospital. Um, but it only leads to you to imagine what would happen if if ultimately um, some external actor hadn't been there on that particular yeah. day. So so that, that, amongst many other things, I think Alex has, has sort of uh, affected the way I, I think about the consequences, the broader consequences of these of these conflicts on people. It's very valuable though. It's a very valuable perspective because we're disconnected from the suffering of a lot of people across the world. So I think it's so important you tell that story to conceptualize and give people kind of that, like this is one example of many millions. And equally, I have the same qu second last question, the same thing. What is a moment you've experienced the most fear? Is there any moment you had where you had a real fear for your life in a lot of these countries, and what is that equivalent story? Um, look, that's a good question. I mean, yes, there are many times where I've been scared. Maybe I scare quite easily. Um, sometimes where you reflect and you think, well, perhaps I shouldn't have been so scared in that in that context, and and many situations in which probably I had very very good reason to be to be quite scared. I always hesitate a little bit, Alex, to tell. You know, the war stories of the expatriate deployed overseas. And I, I do that not because expatriate humanitarian workers don't sacrifice. They do, and they do very much. And I certainly have some colleagues who've, who've sacrificed everything uh, for their commitment to humanitarianism. I rather avoid those stories more because the real humanitarian crisis is not day to day the expatriate who can come and ultimately go and makes to some degree a decision to be in this complex environment but the real humanitarian story is those who are there in situ all day every day year in year out and some of them actually are in the humanitarian and development work themselves and what i'm thinking of there are people for example who work for for us the red cross red crescent movement the the Syrian Red Crescent Society um, has 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 paid a very high price uh, in in lives in, in the very high human cost for their humanitarian action over what is it now um, five or six or seven years in in, in Syria, um, and I was always reminded working with colleagues in places like Afghan Afghanistan of what they went through. I had I had one colleague once. Um, who on a drive back uh, from a destination outside of Kabul was relaying to me the stories of the experience of his family in what was Kabul in the 1990s. It's what some people sometimes call the battle for Kabul. Uh, I mean, what was at stake was controlling Kabul. And what was happening often um, was shelling from outside of the city that was landing indiscriminately. And the stories this my colleague was telling me uh, during the drive were horrendous and deeply tragic. I mean, really, the family cowering behind insufficient protection uh, and over the days or months of those that period of conflict, they lost family members um, despite their best efforts to try and stay safe. And, and this is a reflection, I think, of, of a discussion that's also happening now in the humanitarian space, including with us at the ICRC, the kind of consequences of things like conflict in a populated area, because in Kabul at that time, the shelling wasn't directed at my colleague and his family. It really wasn't. But simply by virtue of him being in that city and these kind of weapons that were used that really couldn't be directed against a lawful target were landing here, there and everywhere leaving people to essentially live in fear of when the next munition would land anywhere near their house at any stage, day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really uh, you know, complex and, and, and tragic situation, I think, um, and, and made more complex and tragic by the fact that, as we've said, these conflicts are, are going on uh, for such a long period of time. Yeah, I mean, that you've highlighted, I think, the fear 
of what it would be like to live there and some of your colleagues, which I really appreciate that perspective. And now fittingly to finish on a more optimistic note, David, <laughs> um, I would love to know in all your lifetime, what is the most awe inspiring, soul touching moment of inspiration that you've seen in your humanitarian work anywhere across the world? Oh, look, all all sorts of things, all sorts of things, Alex. Um, I've, 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 there, there, I've, I've been in a situation um, where a, a young boy, a, a, a peddler of, of Coke cans for next to nothing, you know, the kind of person who's selling uh, soft drink to passers-by and earning next to nothing for the for the privilege of doing so. Someone really in a very dire situation um, approached my colleagues and I once when we were in a difficult situation. You know, we felt that our security had been threatened. We were visibly uncomfortable um, and we were visibly in a difficult place. And this young boy approached us with his wares, you know, his, his cans of, of fizzy pop, and he offered them to us. And what was embarrassing in hindsight was that we immediately assumed that this was a, a, a sale. We assumed this was a transaction. I mean, here is someone who's barely getting by. His main aim is to is to sell Coca-Cola by the side of the road day in, day out. And here he was to us in a very stressed and, and, and complex environment offering them to us. And we immediately said, oh, oh, no, thank you. No, 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 thank you. Thank you very much. And it transpired that this young man was offering us to have a drink out of the goodness of his heart because he could see that we were in a difficult position and we were stressed and we were worried about our, our prevailing circumstances. So I use that to say that even those folk um, in, in the most dire of all predicaments... Where was that? Uh, that was also, sorry, it was also in Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah, speaking a lot to the Afghan context because I spent a number of, a number of years there. Um, so you see these little pearls of, of humanity, I think, wherever you go. And that's, and that's very, very fortunate. Now, I've got many other stories of, of being uplifted and, and life affirmed by, by working in the kind of work that I've been doing with, with my colleagues and friends. Um, but that one certainly sticks with me. David, thank you so much for, uh, for telling that story. I'd love to hear uh, more in the future if we ever get a chance to do a round two um, in person or if you need uh, a platform in the future to provide or if I can do anything to help to provide a small platform to voice these topics, then I'd be honoured uh, to do it again. Otherwise, I'm very grateful for all you do and all the ICRC do and um, this conversation. Thank you. Alex, look, thank you very, very much. Thanks you, thank you to your listeners. Um, thank you for your interest in these topics. I mean, nuclear weapons, as you say, uh, are really right at the heart of, of one of our big uh, humanitarian and ultimately, as you say, existential uh, concerns. So I think you're, you're putting the cursor where it needs to be in terms of these discussions. Thank you so much. Um, and I do look forward to speaking again. In the meantime, I wish you a lovely day. Thank you, David. Great to Thanks. speak to you. Bye-bye. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. <laughs> we're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.